Thank you for the coming to the September edition of the All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. It might have been the, maybe it was the topic, ouch, red imported fire ants in the landscape that's drawn your attention. Uh, thank you, Vicki Bertinotti, for being here today. She will be the speaker. Yep. And we have Janet Hurley from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension IPM coordinator in the chat box today here to help answer those questions. So we've got a big webinar today, so I'll go ahead and turn it over. All righty. Thank you much, Danny. All right, guys. So today we are going to talk about the red imported fire ant and I'm gonna go kind of fast because I have so many slides to go through, but this is the thing is that I'm gonna answer almost all of y'all's questions because I have been doing this talk so long. Um, I started working for the Alabama Fire Ant Management Program in 2001, and I ended up working through graduate school working with fire ants and biological control of fire ants with Dr. Fudd Graham at Auburn University. And now I am at Clemson Extension and I still get to talk about my very favorite insect. So let's get started. All right, this is really and truly what it feels like. I mean, it's, it's us versus them. And I tell you what, this would be fantastic, especially for you folks that have moved down south and did not know that such a thing as fire ants were here. I found this fun picture online. I thought it was very appropriate um, right there in the fire lane. But one of the first things that we want to talk about is identification of fire ants. And when you look at these things, some of them have wings. These are called alates. They're reproductives. And people get them confused with termites. And so we want to look at some features between ants and termites so that we can tell which one's which. One of the first things we're going to look at are the antennae. On termites, they have straight antennae. And on ants, they have geniculate. That's the, that's the $5 word. Or they have elbowed antennae. Their wings look a little bit different. On termites, the forewing and the hind wing are equal lengths. And then on fire ants, the forewing is longer than the hind wing. And then when we look at their waistlines, termites have a broad waist and fire ants have a, a thin thread-like waist. Now I have a question for you guys. Do fire ants bite? Or do they sting? Hmm. They actually do both. So what happens, Mark, you're right. So what happens is that she will bite and she injects a little bit of formic acid, but that's not really what irritates our skin. What irritates our skin are the alkaloids and the venom. And so she uses her mouth parts to anchor her body so that she can sting us. And you can see over here in this right photo, if you look at the tip of the stinger, you can see a little drop of, of uh, venom right there. And several of you have expressed that you guys are, are working through this right now and know intimately about fire ant stings. And what happens is, is, when she stings you and your skin has that reaction, it'll end up forming a little pustule um, on your skin. One of the things that I get a whole lot of is folks wanting to know what an ant is. So they'll call me on the phone and they say, I've got this little black ant. It's got six legs, two antennae. What is it? And this is one of those things where I can't identify the ant, um, not, certainly not by a description on the phone alone. Um, Dr. Tim Davis did his PhD work. He did a survey of the ants of South Carolina in 2009 and found at least 121 different species just in South Carolina. Dr. Eric Benson was talking to us and he said that it's probably upwards of 
200, 225, 250 species just in South Carolina. So when you call with a, with a verbal description, I don't know what it is. So you're like, well, I'm gonna send a picture and I want y'all to look at all these ants that are up here. To you guys, they all kind of look the same. I mean, they're, they're a little bit different with, with body size, but for the most part, they're just ants. And you would say they're small, they're brown, they're black, they've got six legs, they've got antennae. But look at this. In just this picture alone, I've got seven different species up here. So these are actually, ants are very difficult to, to identify. So when we're talking about fire ants, one of the first things that I'm going to look at are their body sizes. So on the left-hand side picture, we've got what we call monomorphism. When you look at these ants, all of their body sizes, they're all, they're all very similar. Fire ants, on the other hand, are what we call polymorphic. So when you look at this photo on the right, you'll see this wheel, and you'll see the ant body sizes are small, medium, medium, large, and then large. And once an ant encloses, that's, that's emerges as an adult, once they emerge, that's the size they're gonna be. You don't grow from a little ant to a big ant. Um, so all, but all of these different body sizes are in a fire ant colony. Then when we get really, really close to them, we're gonna start looking at some of their morphological features. One of the first things we're going to look at are their nodes. How many nodes are present? So when you start looking at the ant keys, they're talking about nodes. This is, this is structures on the petiole, and the petiole is a structure between the thorax and the abdomen, and the keys start off as one-node ants and two-node ants. Fire ants happen to be two-node ants. And then whenever it comes to ants, we do a lot of antennal segment counting. In particular for fire ants, um, they've got a 10 segmented antennae with a two segmented club. And then we start counting teeth on their mandibles and fire ants have four teeth on their mandible. And then one of the most important features so that we know that this is indeed a fire ant is the business end. This is the stinger. Now, how did ants get here and where did they come from? Fire ants showed up, there's two different species. There's a red imported species and a black imported species, but they both came from South America. What happened was is that North America was shipping farm equipment down to South America. And in that process, South America didn't have anything to ship back to us. So they put soil into the boats as ballast and then when they got to the port of mobile they dumped out the soil and guess what we got fire ants so what happened was is the black imported species came in about 1918 the red imported species came in between 1933 and 1945 and by the 1970s much of the southeastern united states had fire ants in 1998, they were discovered in California. By 2000, 13 states in Puerto Rico had fire ants. 2001, they were found in Australia and New Zealand. 2004, they were found in Taiwan and China. 2005, they were found in Hong Kong and Philippines. May 2017, they were found in Japan. September 2017, they were found in Korea. So you guys can see that this is, this is a worldwide invasion by fire ants. Now, fire ant populations in the US are five times greater than they are in South America. Why is that? Because we have an ecological imbalance happening in the US. We don't have any natural enemies, not many anyway, that help us keep fire ant populations in check as opposed to South America, where they have um, native ant competition, they've got parasite competition, they've got diseases, they've got pathogens. <coughs> and so they have a lot of help whenever it comes to managing fire ants. D 
Did you know that fire ants cost Americans six billion dollars a year? Did you get that number? Six billion. <coughs> <coughs> Now, whenever it comes to fire ant population, you'll notice for the most part that fire ants are in the south. They tend not to go above about the Mason-Dixon line. Why is that? It's not because of the sweet tea. It's because of the climate. And so it's, it's really, you have to remember that these are tropical insects, subtropical insects. They don't like the cold. Then if you'll notice out west, there's not a whole lot going on out there because it is so dry. Now, how do fire ants spread? We've got the transport of colonies or mated queens in nursery stocks, sod, and soil. And you have to look at, whenever it comes to invasive species, a lot of them are moved in the nursery trade. <coughs> You also have the transport of mated queens in pickups, railroad cars, trailers, um, and any kind of vehicle, really. And then you also have rafting. Um, this has also been in the news with every hurricane we've had. It was in the news with Katrina. It was in the, it was, uh, in the news um, just this past week. It was in the news with Dory, and I saw some pictures online. And whenever it comes to rafting, this is, a, this is an amazing behavior that fire ants have because you have to remember that they are floodplain insects and their bodies um, lend themselves to building these rafts. And what happens is, is the, their, their, their exoskeletons and also the hairs on their exoskeletons are hydrophobic. And so that gives them the ability to hold on to air bubbles and use those as flotation devices, but also to stay afloat when they are actually on the surface of the water. You can see in this picture uh, labeled C that um, this is the, the buoyancy and the elasticity um, whenever they're trying to push this raft down they're not breaking the surface tension of the water, they're pushing it with a twig, and it's not breaking the surface tension. And so that's a, that's a huge way that fire ants are moving is because of rafts. Now, some studies have shown that whenever brood is present, that those rafts tend to live. Um, they can wait out the floodwaters, but whenever brood, and whenever I say brood, I'm talking about egg larvae pupa, whenever the brood is not present, that raft will sink within a few hours and those ants will die. They also spread through natural mating flights. And what happens is, is they have these mating flights um, within about 24 hours after a rain, and the reproductives, the males and the females, um, those are the ones that are going to be leaving the mounds and having these mating flights. So what we're talking about here is there's a female on the left. Um, you'll notice that she's kind of rusty colored, but her head is proportional to her body and you can see her wings. So that's how you know that that's a reproductive. We've got a male over here on the right. Um, the males tend to be all black. Um, and they're called buffalo ants sometimes because you can see they're, they got a big hump back. And then their heads are not proportional to their bodies. They have a little itty bitty head. They only have one job, so they don't need a lot of brains. Now these mating flights, whenever they happen, they're usually 24 hours with, within about 24 hours after rain. There's low wind, high humidity, but these reproductives are a big drain on resources for the mound, for the colony, and so the workers want to get those, want to get those reproductives out. So they have these mating flights. They'll crawl up to um, the top of a, a piece of grass. They'll fly up several hundred feet into the air. They do their thing. They drop back down to the ground. The females are going to remove their wings and start looking for a place to start a colony. The males, on the other hand, they've done their job and they die. 
Now, these newly mated queens, they're highly vulnerable to predators such as lizards, frogs, fish, birds, um, other insects. Um, they're, they're subject to the environment. Um, if it's particularly hot on a patch of bare soil, they may get fried on there, a piece of concrete, hit something that's metal that's really hot. Um, and then also poor judgment. They fall into water all the time and end up dying. So um, not as many native, mated queens are going to make it um, to start a colony. But the ones that do, after they remove those wings, they're going to start breaking down those wing muscles to use that energy. And she's going to lay a small clutch of eggs. Those eggs are going to hatch, and she's going to be feeding those larvae oil from her crop, some protein secretions from the salivary glands, some infertile eggs. She's not going to be eating. All she's going to be doing is laying eggs. And then this first group of ants is going to complete their life cycle um, and become adult, adults, and we call those first workers minims. After about a month, those new workers are going to open up the mound, they're going to start foraging, and they're going to start mound construction. And by then, the queen is producing several hundred eggs per day. Now, these mounds may not be visible when they're less than about three months old. When we start seeing them pop up, is they're probably about six months old. This is a familiar sight to all you folks. And when we see a fire ant mound, we need to think about a fire ant mound like an iceberg. What we see above ground is nothing compared to what's underground. <coughs> now you'll notice that it talks about a hard crust on the top, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But there's tunnels out to the sides, and that's where those fire ants come in and out of the colony. <coughs> This mound is full of galleries and chambers. Um, they're absolutely amazing engineers. Mature colonies and mature mounds. So whenever I talk about a colony, I'm talking about the ants themselves. And a mature mound, I'm talking about the dirt structure. Um, so the mound, whenever it's mature, depending on soil type, um, between 24 and 40 inches wide, maybe 15 inches high, but we have seen them where they're almost three feet high when it's built out of clay and, and up next to a fence post or in a shrub. Um, now the carrying capacity as far as how many individuals there are is anywhere from 200 to 400,000 workers. And by this time, the queen is laying her own, eight, her own weight in eggs per day. So what happens is, is the, the adults have their mating flight, the males die, the newly mated queens drop down, they start, they start looking for a place to start their colony, they lay some eggs. After about a week, those eggs hatch um, into the larval stage. And fire ants have four larval stages. And this is an important note. So keep that for a few slides later. Now. What's gonna happen is those, those larvae are gonna go through their four instars and turn into pupae, and then they'll pupate and turn into an adult. Now remember that wheel of ants that I showed you at the beginning with all the different body sizes. The smaller adults live 60 to 90 days, and the larger adults live 90 to 120 days, and then the queens can live up to seven years. Did you hear that? I said seven years. We've got a couple different situations going on when it comes to how many queens there are in a colony. Um, this is mostly a problem in Texas. Um, they have multiple queen colonies where they're having 200 to 800 mounds per acre. Um, overall, when you look at these um, relative to single queen colonies, the workers tend to be smaller. Um, the colonies reproduce by budding, they're not territorial, um, and therefore you don't have other fire ant colonies helping to keep populations in check. 
these queens are laying fewer eggs, but there's more ant, there's more egg production because there are more queens overall. Um, this is a very difficult situation to manage. Um, this is this picture is from Texas. This is those are not cow patties. Those are fire ant mounds. For the most part in the southeast, what we deal with is single queen colony situations where we've got 50 to 80 mounds per acre and there's one queen per colony. The fire ant workers are very territorial, so you'll have one large mound and the territory is quite large and the, the workers help manage that territory. And so that's why the populations are only 50 to 80 mounds instead of what they have in Texas, um, 200 to 800 mounds. This is, for the most part, the majority of fire ant colonies are single queen colony type. I get this question all the time. Whenever it comes to fire ants, what good are they? Well, they're actually really beneficial insects. When they're present in an ecosystem, they are one of the top predators in that ecosystem. They prey on caterpillars, beetle larvae, flea larvae, cockroach eggs, ticks, chiggers, anything that, that preys on ticks and chiggers, I am all for. Um, they're actually really good predators, all, I mean, uh, really good scavengers also. And then think about how much soil they move. So they're moving soil that could be this horrible clay compacted soil and they're changing the soil profile. Not changing the soil type, but they're, they're aerating it, making the soil more friable. Now, as non-beneficial insects, they can make some problems worse, especially whenever it comes to sap sucking insects like aphids or soft scale, um, because what happens is they tend those insects in exchange for the honeydew that those insects produce. So they protect those insects in exchange for that honeydew. So they can make those populations explode or be larger than if ants weren't present. They also have indirect and direct effects on, inverte on vertebrates. Um, they, they attack some of the, the pipping bird, ground nesting birds whenever they're trying to come out of their, their eggs. Um, they've also been known whenever animals such as deer, cattle, horses, sheep, goats, if the mamas can't get those babies up fast enough, we've got a number of cattlemen that lose calves every year to fire ants. And then also whenever it comes to crop damage, have any of y'all tried to grow okra? Have y'all noticed that the fire ants will eat the okra pods? The thing about fire ants is that a lot of your insects, whenever they attack um, vegetable fruit, they tend not to attack healthy stuff. A lot of times um, they're, they're going for stuff that's already damaged. Fire ants will, will damage sound, sound fruit. That can be a big problem. They typically nest in the ground, um, but for anybody that works for any kind of electrical group, y'all have noticed that they will nest in the gas and water meter boxes, in air conditioning units. Um, we've got some other pictures where they've, they've completely um, filled up a circuit. Um, and then we've got the problem that you see on the right where they've been chewing the wire insulation. That produces bare wires and short circuits, and, and this is a problem. So, in times of desperation, you're gonna have to use some stuff. Um, we can't all be like the ant bully here. Have y'all seen the ant bully? Look at their slogan, the battle for the lawn is on. So, we're, we're gonna have to use some of our tools in our toolbox to manage fire ants. Now, there's a lot of stuff out there that you are going to read on the internet that will manage fire ants. Most of these are myths, and we do not recommend 
do-it-yourself pest control. A lot of these home remedies are, um, are wives' tales, and they don't work. Um, one of the biggest ones we have is grits. That's one of the oldest ones, is that fire ants eat the grits, and then it makes their stomachs blow up. And if you use instant grits, it's supposed to be, their stomachs are supposed to blow up faster and it's supposed to be more violent of an explosion. That's not how that works. So if you're trying to feed fire ants something to make them blow up, what you should know is that adult fire ants cannot digest solid food. Remember I told you about the fourth end star larva. Keep this, keep this in mind whenever, for a few more slides. Fourth end star larva and can't eat solid food. We're going to talk about that. We've had recommendations that you take white potatoes, cut them in half, jam them down into the fire ant mound, and that gets rid of fire ants. We had somebody tell us that you take a white potato that's on sale and you put it in a fire ant mound and it gets rid of fire ants. We've had somebody tell us that you take a white potato. She didn't specify the price, but you take a white potato, you jam it down in the fire ant mound and cover it with a brick, and that'll get rid of fire ants. We've had people tell us that you take cucumbers and you slice them up and you put them across your threshold, and that's supposed to get rid of fire ants. We've had people tell us that you take coffee grounds or tea grounds and you put those in the fire ant mounds and those get rid of fire ants. We've had people tell us that you can use cat litter, used, unused, clumping, non-clumping, um, lightweight, regular stuff, that you put that down in the fire ant mound, and that gets rid of fire ants. We've had people tell us that you take club soda and you pour it down into the fire ant mound, and because it's so fizzy, it sucks out all the oxygen, and then the fire ants die. We've had People tell us that you use any kind of petroleum product. It doesn't have to be lit. You don't have to light it on fire, but people think fire is more fantastic. And so they light stuff on fire, and that's supposed to get rid of fire ants. While the petroleum products would get rid of fire ants, you don't want to do that. Um, that's not a legal use of petroleum products. It can taint the groundwater. Um, and then there's also the danger of you burning yourself, you burning somebody else, something, a structure that's important to somebody burning down, which has happened. Um, and so we don't recommend any kind of petroleum product, and we certainly don't recommend that you light it on fire. There's lots of stuff out there available. Now we have folks that want to use boiling water as an alternative. Um, the studies have shown that boiling water, whenever you use it, um, you're going to have a bald spot in your landscape where you have killed everything. You've killed all of the insects. You have killed um, all of the microbes that live in the soil. You've killed all of the foliage. You've basically sterilized that spot. And that's really not recommended either. Uh, because you're going to have to make it outside with a good bit of boiling water depending on the size of the mound and we don't want anybody getting burned. Um, it's pretty tough to to get outside with a pot of boiling water without scalding yourself so this is also not recommended. Now we have a number of insecticide formulations that we do recommend. Um, there's wettable powders, there's liquid concentrates, there's granules, there's dust, and there's baits. And we really like baits a whole lot. So we're mostly going to talk about baits. Now, whenever it comes to any kind of pesticide for use with fire ants, and whenever I say pesticide, pesticide is any chemical, whether it is organic or conventional, that kills a pest. And organic does not necessarily mean safer. Um, and so what we need to do is make sure that we are using a labeled pesticide that is labeled by EPA. 
And then we want to make sure that we're following all the instructions whenever it comes to that pesticide. Because it is a violation of federal law to use a pesticide in a manner inconsistent with its label. So what I tell people is to read the entire label, understand and comprehend the entire label, and if there's something you don't understand on there, call your local extension agent and they will help you interpret that label. And then we're also, the last thing is that we're gonna follow all label instructions. No matter if we agree with them or not, we want to follow all label instructions so that we are applying this product safely and in accordance with the law. Now there's lots of stuff out there available and we're gonna talk about a few of these. So whenever it comes to speed of control, what we have to remember is that for the most part, fire ant management, especially with baits, is not going to be an instant gratification type thing. Depending on product, and then depending on some other factors such as time of year, rainfall, UV exposure, heat, it may take longer for it to work. Um, some of your faster products are like Advion, um, and then some of your slower products are gonna be like Extinguish. We do recommend that you use something called the Texas Two-Step, where you're combining a bait with a contact insecticide. So you put your bait out, and then about a week later, you come back with a contact insecticide for what we call problem mounds. Problem mounds are going to be the ones where the dog sleeps, next to where you park your car, next to one of the doors, um, things like that. Whenever it comes to contact insecticides, um, you can use those for individual mound treatments, um, but these, these uh, usually do work very, very quickly. Whenever it comes to cost of control, um, your baits are usually going to be less than about $25, and um, the, the standard um, is top choice. And for a long time, it was well above $200 an acre. And what we found is that um, the price has come down significantly. Now, just like the speed of control, the duration of control is also going to be dependent on rainfall, the season of application, the soil type, the original population density, reinvasion pressure, um, and then also your tolerance level. About 80% of people try to control fire ants by treating individual mounds. But we found that individual mound treatments are expensive. It requires a lot of time. Um, it's very labor intensive because you have to go out and you've got to find each individual mound and treat it. If you miss any, then you've missed them and you're, you're still making fire ants out there. So um, whenever you're using individual mound treatments, sometimes it's easy to use too much insecticide. Um, and you don't want to be putting any more pesticides into the environment than necessary. Typically, you're not going to kill the queen with an individual mound treatment. And like I said earlier, you're going to miss a lot of stuff. So whenever it comes to baits, um, what you're looking at is a uh, ground up corn cob matrix. And that's where people got the idea that you feed ants grits and they blow up. But that's not how that works. The, the corn cobs, um, what they do is that's, that's called a carrier that gives something, the ant something to hang on to. We use soybean oil as an attractant, and then we've got our active ingredient, which is the toxicant in there. And these fire ants think that this is food, so they go out actively looking for stuff. Now, I told you guys that the fourth instar larva was the important life stage because there is no life stage in the fire ant mound in that colony, except for the fourth end star larva that can, that can break down and digest solid food. So that fourth end star larva is extremely important. What happens is, is the adult ants 
will bring that food particle back to the fourth instar larva. They lay that food particle on the fourth instar larva's chest. It's actually called a buccal pouch. And then she burps up enzymes to, to digest this solid food into a liquid form. And then she transfers that with the nurse ants and they share this in a process called trophallaxis. So the fire ant workers pass these liquid foods to one another by regurgitating that liquid food from their crop until the food is distributed to all the members of the colony, including the queen. Just like with anything, there's advantages and disadvantages. Now some disadvantages of baits is that if you put your bait out at the wrong time of day or it's too hot, the UV rays are gonna break down that insecticide and the heat is also gonna break down the insecticide. The timing of applications, you've got a window of time in the year, not only within the day, but also within the year to put these baits down. And also baits do not store very well. Typically, when we buy stuff, we like to buy as much as we can for the best price. Well, the bad thing is, is that whenever you buy too much fire ant bait, and most of us buy a little bit more than we need, and we put it in our garage. Well, what do we put in our garage? If it's like mine, it's not a vehicle because there's too much stuff in it. But we've got a lawnmower in there. There's gas cans in there. There's oil. There's other insecticides, there's fertilizers, there's paint, and all of those have volatile chemicals. And when they're in the same room with the fire ant bait, the bait soaks up those smells. And if the bait soaks up those smells, it smells bad, it tastes bad, the fire ants won't pick it up whenever you apply it. Now some advantages of baits is that it's easy to apply because there's, a, there's, there's equipment that we can use. There's several different spreaders that we can use. Um, they're lightweight, they're low cost, um, and now they're even battery operated. But these whirly bird, these hand spreaders do really well. Um, the gate needs to be closed far enough so that only the product just barely comes out. Um, typically, if you use something like a belly spreader or if you use a drop spreader, it puts out way more product than what you need. And so we like using these, these small whirly bird spreaders. If you've got larger expanses of land, um, you can purchase a herd seeder. Um, herd worked with fire ant researchers to develop this spreader um, that. Um, is a galvanized um, hopper there and it'll hold 25 pounds worth of fire ant bait and depending on what product you buy the restrictor plates at the top the there's a booklet that comes with a herd seeder that tells you put in this restrictor plate for this bait drive this fast and it'll put out the recommended amount of fire ant bait <coughs> For extremely large expanses of land, you can apply it aerially, either by airplane or by helicopter. And now we're working on drone application too. Um, and these will still put it out accurately at a, a pound to a pound and a half per acre. Baits are cost effective, um, generally less than about $25 an acre. And it's a pretty good use of time um, because these ants are doing the work for you. Um, they're actively seeking this stuff out. Um, it's, very, it's very easy to put bait out because you're walking so fast. You're trying to get a pound to a pound and a half out per acre. Did y'all hear that? A pound to a pound and a half per acre. So you're not buying a whole lot of product. There's a number of baits that are labeled for use in urban areas. Now, what you have to be careful of is read the label and make sure that it is legal for you to apply that in your application. So if you are applying out in a cow pasture, 
in a horse pasture, goat pasture, sheep pasture, whatever it is, if it's got livestock on it, those are going to be different products than as if you are putting it on turf. And then also, if you are putting this in a vegetable garden, we don't like to put pesticides in the vegetable garden. So if it's a small enough garden, you can put it around the perimeter of the garden and it never has to go in the garden. The fire ants will forage out. Fire ants will forage almost a football field away from their colony, depending on territory size. Um, but you don't have to put it in the garden at all. Um, that's one of the beautiful things about baits is that the fire ants forage out of their areas to go look for this stuff. Whenever it comes to bodies of water, fire ants are naturally attracted to the water's edge. Um, so the populations are pretty dense around, around the edge of a, of a body of water. Um, and rafting can make it a little tr tricky. So what you wanna be careful of is make sure that you never ever throw product into the water. Um, remember that fire ants will forage up to a football field away from their colonies. So check the label and it'll talk about a buffer zone um, and fire ants will forage um, to go get that bait. So there's no reason to put bait in the water at all. Some tips for successful management when using the bait. We've had questions about, well, when do I put it out? Your timing for the most part is gonna be late May, early June, and late September, early October. So what we're telling people to do is, is that you apply two times a year, in the spring and in the fall. So your spring treatment is gonna, is gonna manage ants from the spring through the summer into your fall treatment. You treat in the fall, and then that fall treatment is gonna work from the fall through the winter to the next spring whenever you make your next application. So what you're doing is you're putting yourself on a baiting program twice a year. We wanna do this early in the morning or late in the afternoon when the soil temperatures are between 70 and 85 degrees. Not the ambient temperature, the soil temperature. Now you don't have to go buy a thermometer to test this. We tell people use a potato chip test. So get a regular greasy potato chip, put it down at the soil level. You can leave it for anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes. Come back and check it. If there's fire ants on it, then that means that they're foraging and you can put your bait out. If there's no fire ants on that potato chip, it's too hot, too cold, too windy, something's going on, the fire ants are not foraging, do not put out your bait. You need to make sure that it's going to be dry. So you don't want it to rain, either before, during, or after your application. And you wanna also make sure that your irrigation system is off. Now, one of the things that we get questions about is what about the birds? What about my chickens? What about my ducks? What about my horses? And fire ant baits are some of the safest products on the market because they are very low toxicity. Um, if, it's, if they're so toxic that as soon as the ants pick it up, they die, they're not getting it back to the queen and, and we're not accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. So this is actually pretty safe stuff. Um, if you're worried about your chickens and your ducks and your dogs and your horses, you should put the dogs and the horses and the ducks up, make your application, and then you can take them back, you can bring them back out after the fire ants have picked all of the product up. We recommend anywhere from um, two to six hours. Um, if you wanna be really safe, you can wait 12 hours and then put your animals back out. Remember what I told you about storage of bait? You wanna put this in a cool area and don't store your bait with pesticides, gasolines, or other volatile chemicals. And you don't wanna mix your baits with other stuff before you apply it either. Something else we get a question about is, what about the other 200 and something species of ants in my landscape? Fire ant bait and most of your baits um, are very targeted to a specific insect. 
and fire ant baits get fire ants and maybe about 15 other species. They're in what we call the Geminata complex. They're very closely related, um, but they're not going to have such a huge impact that you're getting rid of all of your other beneficial ants. If ants are present in that, in that system, they are typically going to beat out the other species of ants. So it's, it's actually a, a, a pretty targeted application whenever we're using baits. As before, whenever you're using a pesticide, you wanna make sure that you read the label because the label is the law. We wanna read that entire label. If you have a question about it, contact your, your extension system and then follow all label instructions. So the takeaway for this is that there is no silver bullet whenever it comes to fire ants and their biologies do not lend for them to be eradicated. You'll notice in this talk, I never used the word eradicate. I talked about management and control because those are our options. There's not any one best way to manage fire ants, um, especially on a large scale, but what we're trying to do is use all the tools that we have available um, and find the best approach for effective fire ant management. So we're trying to use, we're trying to find and use the methods that are most environmentally sound, cost effective, and then also fit our tolerance level for fire ants. A lot of this stuff is housed on eExtension, and you guys are welcome to uh, visit that. And if y'all have questions, concerns, or consternations, uh, Janet, Danny, and I will hopefully answer some of them. Thank you. I see a couple of questions up there. If you, we have a few minutes to answer some. And one of them was, and this is specific thoughts on the chemical. This was, what are your thoughts on come and get it? That's, that's spinosa, right? Yes. Um, so whenever it comes to using spinosad, what we found out is that um, it works. It works very quickly, but we have also found that the populations bounce back very quickly. And sometimes the populations tend to be worse than what we started with. Janet, do you have any more thoughts on that? Actually, I, I was trying to do three things at once, but I was going to write on about the, that come and get it if there was a couple of y'all asking about gardens. When I talk to my school gardens, this is one of the few products we do recommend in Texas. To put in the garden, yes. To, to put in and around the gardens because it's labeled to be used around a vegetable crop. Right? And there are very few products labeled for inside the vegetable garden. That's why I mentioned about putting, um, applying, turf baits outside of the garden but you never ever put them inside the garden and there's a couple of questions up now how well do armadillas and anteaters control fire ants <laughs> so um, we're never ever going to get ant eaters here <laughs> yeah we're never ever going to get ant eaters here um because they, they would be an invasive species that we are bringing in, an exotic species. Um, now, whenever it comes to armadillos, um, I'm actually doing a, uh, a workshop with a, with a forestry natural resources agent um, at the end of the month, talking about armadillos and fire ants, but not necessarily armadillos and fire ants. Um, it'll be two different, two different talks. But we have seen where armadillos do go into fire ant mounds and they eat the brood because the brood it's it's great a great protein source it's very fatty um so it's a, it's a good nutritional source for them and typically what happens is, is the armadillos will go in there and they mess up the mound really bad um, because of their foraging and the ants get really angry and then they move And there was another one, and this was actually, uh, I'll have to find it again. Are they a medical threat? Like, like honeybees can be when you're, when it, an example, when you have anaphyla anaphylaxis shock, when you're stuck yes. bees and. 
I'll just say I'm about to go to the doctor right now. I'm not going to go to the okay, doctor. So go ahead. This is something I can personally speak about because in Texas we did have a child um, that was stung, um, went into anaphylaxis, didn't get treated quick enough, and he did die. Mm -hmm. So this can happen, but it does take a lot of the venom, and it typically happens to younger, say 12 and under, and elderly. We've had problems in the past with um, mm -hmm. nursing home patients. So mm -hmm. yes, I mean, this is one of those, we consider it a medically important insect pest as well. Absolutely. And we really talk about, whereas bees, you can't do much, Fire ants, you can plan, you can bait. If you know that's going to be an area that's going to be occupied by humans, every one of us here on the um, panel will tell you this is something big that we talk about. Yep. And, and this is one of those things also that we can't say everybody's going to be allergic to it because allergic reactions depend on the person, the individual, and then it also depends on what their body is doing that day um, as, as what your sensitivity is. So, um, but it is overall considered an absolutely medically important insect. And Vicki, we've got same, a question about- Here for, for cattle and livestock as well. Yep, yep. Um, whenever it comes to finding baits, where can you find it? You can find them at any of your box stores. Um, you need to make sure that you are purchasing fresh bait because it has oil in it. Um, when you open up that container, um, you can smell it and it will, you, you can tell, you can smell if the oil is rancid. Um, if the oil is rancid, that bait tastes bad, the ants won't pick it up. Smells bad, tastes bad, the ants won't pick it up. So make sure that you're purchasing fresh bait. And um, it should be a, a nice bright yellow whenever you purchase it. Uh, make sure it's not off color also. I'm thinking about going right now. Think of free, free toes. What was that? I said, when you think of bad bait, think of bad Fritos or Doritos. <laughs> yeah. So Vicki, will you tell them about biological controls? Um, so in South America, there's several different ants that there's some of them that even enslave ants, um, that, that enslave fire ants, um, but other ant populations, um, like, um, big headed ants, pyramid ants, thief ants, um, little black ant, um, all sorts of different, the, the other ant species out there they compete for territory with fire ants. And so they help keep those populations in check. There are also, we've got a couple species of nematodes. There are some viruses. Um, and then there are, maybe you've seen about the little flies that lay their eggs inside the fire ants thorax. That egg hatches, the maggot goes up into the fire ants head uses the fire ant's head as a puparium, secretes an enzyme, and many weeks later makes the fire ant's head fall off. Yay! Um, but we have a number of biological control species here in the United States. Um, however, they are not going to be our saviors. And we've got to use all of our, all of the tools in our toolbox to manage fire ants. Let's see, there's a couple of more. Do fire ants have soldier ants? Have what, what, what? It is a question about soldier ants in a fire ant colony. Okay. So fire ants, everybody has a job, but it does not depend on your size. It depends on your age. And so you are gonna have some workers that are gonna go out there and their job is to defend the territory. So they may not, they're not necessarily called soldiers. And if you look at them, you wouldn't be able to tell soldiers. 
And this is something I did not mention in the talk. So when I showed y'all the slide of the male and the female ant, and I, I showed you that the female was kind of a rusty brown and the male was black, whenever it comes to fire ants, you cannot identify the species of fire ant, whether it's a black imported fire ant or a red imported fire ant, based on looking at it and the color because the red ones are not red and the black ones are not necessarily black and the hybrids we have a hybrid which is what we mostly deal with they're not kind of brownish um the way that we have to identify the different species this makes it sound like i i, I know what i'm talking about you ground them up and you look at their cuticular hydrocarbons what we're talking about is you have to read their dna that's the only way that we can really identify between red imported fire ant, black imported fire ant, and hybrid. And uh, Lewis is asking about what about black imported fire ants in North Carolina? Um, from what we can see, the black imported fire ant has been relegated to a very small area in northeast Mississippi, northwest Alabama, and a little piece of Tennessee. Um, for the most part, we are dealing with either red imported species or we're talking about the hybrid. Let's see, any other questions? Um, Chuck's asking oh, about okay, quarantine. I see that. Um, Janet. Janet, um, are they even, there's, there's fire ant quarantines for, for most? It, it, that's all, there, yes. It's mostly for, it's a, it's a big part in the nursery industry. There are quarantines, absolutely. Um, I was going to say, it's a USDA yeah. RS quarantine. Yes, some states still have it. It's just, it's extremely hard to, actually, it's really hard to enforce. I mean, it, that's the biggest thing, and you'd be surprised. It's it's not the nursery people that we worry about. It's the general population that decides to go from Florida to Texas or Texas to Arizona or some place in between, and you don't realize you're storing stuff. You brought wood or whatever. That's where our insects, our invasives come in the U.S. Is we're really good about taking it in our camper when we go someplace. Yep. Any thoughts on fire ants migrating northward as climate changes? Um, it's a, it, they're, they're not going to go too far north. Um, there's, there's physical barrier, you know, there's mountains everywhere. And that's part of what kept things separate in South America was, was the mountain chains. Um, and then also they're just, their DNA says that they are tropical, subtropical insects. Um, we've done some experimentation with temperature, um, and we're still finding that the cold is the cold is keeping them down. Great, thank you. And there have been lots of comments about how great this presentation has been today. So. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. I know it was last minute. The hurricane threw a little, had a little glitch with the plans for this week, and we appreciate it so much. And we hope to see y'all next month for scale insects on ornamental plants, um, especially some of the crepe myrtles and things. This is gonna be a, a new pest that y'all will probably want to see. Um, that'll be Dr. Jeremy Pickens. Vicki, thank you again. Everybody, y'all have a great weekend. And we'll see y'all next month.